we invite you to stand to worship. You don't need to feel obligated to do so. If you want to sit, please feel free to do that. Anytime during the course of the praise of uh, music, if you wish to sit, feel free to do so. Jesus Christ. 
have a seat. a local farm and that each of these there were four different farms and they all had a big corn maze okay. <clears throat> several times Pam asked if, if we couldn't go into the corn maze and I told her the story that I'm going to tell you and why I have a terrifying fear of corn mazes <clears throat> back in the day many years ago uh, 35 years ago I bought an army navy surplus raft a six-man raft, and after I bought it, I, I got my best friend, and his name was Gary, and he and I went out one um, Saturday afternoon. We went to Duck Creek, which is near Marietta, Ohio, where I was born, and we uh, parked his car at a designated pickup point, and we parked my car at the head of the creek. We jumped up in our raft, and off we went. And about four hours later, we showed up at the rendezvous point and got out of the uh, creek and put the raft up on that. We had a great time. So a few weeks went by and I thought this would be a great thing to take my three sons on. My sons were 12, 11, and 7 at the time. And I told Pam, all right, we're going to be on the river four hours and you pick us up at this point and we're going to tip. We'll go up to this point. You drop us off and four hours later we'll be here because that's what had happened with me and Gary. Right? And so we did that and put the raft in the water and I took along some bottles of water and some peanuts and not much else. <clears throat> well everything went according to plan except for one small detail. In May, or in late April, early May, when I went with Gary, we had just finished having spring rains in Washington and Washington County and the creek was like whoosh! And so four hours we went from point A to point B. In June, not so much water, not so much, and occasionally we have to, we'd have to get out and carry the raft over a low point. <clears throat> so a four-hour trip turned into six, and then seven, and, and the sun went down, and it was before cell phones. I have three small boys separated from their mother on a school on a Sunday night <clears throat> as the sun is going down, and it's getting darker and darker and darker. And the banks of the creek are about this high. And I'm in the middle of nowhere with three small boys with no way to tell their mother we're OK, or, and no idea where I'm at. So I have no idea how to tell her where to come and find us. And, it, and then tick tock, tick tock, and it gets darker and darker. And we just keep floating along. And I know we're not even halfway to where I was aiming at. So finally we come around the bend of the creek and I see the lights of a farmhouse like from here to the bridge beside a John Deere. And so I, I drag the raft up to the edge of the bank and the bank, I'm not joking, the bank was seven feet of mud, of, of dirt. And I'm thinking, <clears throat> do I take each one of these kids and haul them up that bank and then take the raft and the kids and walk through a cornfield that's six feet high aiming for a farmhouse that once I get in the cornfield, I can't see? Or do I leave all three kids in the raft, on the river, by themselves, in total darkness, while I run like a booger through the cornfield, and I used to run at that point, so you know, I, I could go pretty fast. So I made the decision to leave my three children in the raft, in the dark, on the river, by themselves, and climbed up the bank, and started running through that cornfield with the corn slapping me as I'm running with no sight of the farmhouse. I'm just aiming a direction and praying to God that he will get me through to the other side. By the way, I now know what an electric fence feels like. <laughs> Remember, I'm in a bathing suit. <laughs> I found where the cornfield ended and the cow pasture began. I, I climbed over the fence and I went to the farmhouse and the farmer had already gone to sleep. It was 9 o'clock. And I 
pounded and I pounded and I pounded until a very unhappy man came to the door. I told him my story. I begged for mercy and begrudgingly got up, got dressed, got in the pickup truck, went down and got the kids. I called Pam and she came and she was very loving and gracious when she came to pick me up. <laughs> I heard about that for several days. Well, because of that, I am terrified of corn mazes. I don't want to go anywhere near a maze. And yet, when I stopped and thought about it as I was preparing for this sermon, I realized that most of us live our lives in a maze. A maze of our own choosing. Because each of us makes our own decisions about what we're going to do and where we're going to go and how we're going to live. And inevitably, we get ourselves into a mess that we can't seem to find our way out of. Sin creates consequences that buries us in a life of confusion. Living our lives in selfishness is like being in the middle of a complex corn maze. But the good news of the morning is Jesus offers us a way out. The sermon is based on two passages of Scripture, one from Jesus and one from a letter of Paul. We're going to begin with Paul's letter first, which is from Ephesians chapter 2. Hear now the word of the Lord. <clears throat> and you were dead in your trespasses in sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Word of God for the people of God. In the opening of that passage, Paul makes reference to both sins and trespasses. I don't think in that translation. But, uh, but when, when we use the word sins and trespasses, we use them interchangeably. We think they mean the same thing. So why would Paul address both of those at the beginning of the passage? And the answer is they're different. I want to begin where we're going this morning by talking about those two Greek words and what those two words mean. The first of those two words is the word hamartia. hamartia. That comes from the sport of archery. And it means knowing what we're supposed to be hitting, the bullseye, and missing the mark. In the case of Christianity, a holy life is the mark. A holy life being one where we do not consciously cheat, lie, steal, commit adultery, etc. That is God's goal for the Christian life. That is the target. However, we miss the target because of one, for, because of one of three reasons. One, <clears throat> we are living a life where we don't believe in the existence of God. So we are missing the mark through ignorance. Or, number two, a person believes in the existence of God and, and knows that we are required to live a holy life, but doesn't believe or hasn't given their life to Jesus. And so they're missing the mark through refusal, refusal to believe. And the third and more common instance in church is a person does believe in the existence of God. A person believes and is accepted Jesus Christ, but wants to hang on to one really fun, willful habit from the old life. And so they miss the mark through willful disobedience. That's hamartia, sin. Then the other one is a more complicated Greek word called paraptuma. Paraptuma. It literally means to slip side or lapse or deviate. It's always used in reference to the rights of others. <clears throat> now, I have a story to tell you from my personal life that is a perfect example of Hamartia and whatever the other one is. I used to live in Kansas, as I told you. And when we moved there about 10 years ago, <clears throat> um, 
Part of the pastoral agreement that I had to sign was I would mow the grass at the parsonage. It was in my agreement. All right. So fortunately, I had a lawn tractor and I didn't care. So what? You know, we had two thirds of an acre to mow, and I, I enjoyed actually getting out there and mowing and, and being out in the sun. And most importantly, I enjoyed being able to look behind me and see that I'd accomplished something, which is hard to do in a pastor's life. So I'm out there mowing the very first time, and I'm, you know, and, and as I'm mowing across the front yard, here comes my neighbor out of the house across the street. Would be like from here to the sheriff deputy's off, uh, house across the street. Comes running, turn up, you know, it's like turn off the mower, turn off the mower. It's like okay, I turn off the mower, get off the tractor. So I get off the tractor, and he wants to show me and tell me this story. The man who owned the house next to the parsonage has died long ago. But he got upset every time a pastor mowed past the property line. It aggravated him so much, he went out and bought 15 metal discs about like this and planted them in the ground every 25 feet from the road to the end of the property. Remember, we're talking about two-thirds of an acre. That is a long way. <clears throat> And the man who put the discs in the ground, who had this terrible anger about people mowing over the line, is dead. But the neighbor now responsible for mowing the grass wants me to know that the rules are still in force. You will not mow past the line. To be honest about it, he was obnoxious. <laughs> he, he was not a pleasant gentleman at all. And I responded as a good pastor would, I, okay, of course, I will not mow past the line. And for the first several times I mowed the grass, I was very careful to stay on this side of the discs. And then one Saturday, I was out mowing, and I thought, what's he going to do if I mow on the other side of the discs? And so I deliberately, consciously, maliciously, with a smile on my face, drove right down over the discs. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> I mean, after all, the guy who put him there is dead. What is it? You know, what is the guy across the street who mows the yard on, on contract? What does he care? But that is a perfect example of sin and trespass. In, in the first case, or, or of sinning, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I deliberately, consciously, maliciously mowed past the line. I missed the mark. Now, I mowed that backyard approximately 150 times in seven years. And occasionally, I'd be back there mowing and I'd be thinking about the message or I'd be praying about somebody or I'd be thinking about a counseling situation. That I, and all of a sudden, I'd hear, doo -doo 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 -doo. oh man, I'm going over those discs. And that, I did it. I didn't know I was doing it. I did the same thing that I did before I mowed beyond the disc, but I didn't do it intentionally. And that's the definition of trespass. Slip slide, accidentally crossing the line. <clears throat> what is the difference between the two times that I mowed? What's the difference? I did exactly the same thing both times, but what's the difference in what I did? What's the difference between sin and trespass? <laughs> Intent. Intent. In the one case, I strayed over the line just by sheer accident. I was distracted. My mind was elsewhere. And the other one, I was like, yeah, we do it. That is intent. And that's the difference between sin and trespass. Jesus makes the point that everyone will get an opportunity to sin, to be tempted to cross the line. But as a general rule, Christians won't do that. Intentionally going across the line is sin. Accidentally going across the line is trespass. All right? <clears throat> now here's another example. Okay? This is Bob Ferris sitting in the front row here. And, and Bob has his foot out towards the aisle. And earlier this week... I went to see, <laughs> earlier this week, I went to see Bob, he's a trustee, I needed him to do something, and I asked him to do something, and he said no. 
So this morning, in the course of preaching, I, I kind of wander over this way, and while I'm preaching away, I uh, stomp on Bob's foot. Well, and I just keep talking, pretend it didn't happen and everything's fine, and Bob kind of winces and blinds with pain a little bit. That would be the definition of sin. Because I deliberately, consciously, with malice of forethought, stomped on Bob's foot. He deserved it, by the way. <laughs> That's all a made up story just for the sake of the sermon. But if in the course of walking around, which I tend to do, I lose track of where I am and I come over this way and I step on Bob's foot accidentally, that my definition is of trespass because I had no intent. I accomplished the same thing, but the difference is in my intent. All right, let's take a look at the Luke passage where Jesus has something to say about this issue of sin and trespass. And Jesus said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should be one, should cause one of these little ones to sin. Whether Jesus is talking to children or immature Christians has been an argument for centuries. But the point of the story is, Everyone is going to be tempted to sin. By the way, the Greek word in that case is scandala, scandala, from which we get our English word scandal. Very good. <clears throat> scandala um, has a very interesting meaning. It's a, it's a proper noun in Greek, and it's the proper noun for a trip stick. Do I have any hunters in the crowd that have ever used a trip stick? It's taught in a survival school. And it is a device that has a noose and bait and a bent sapling. And when the animal steps in and nibbles the food, it somehow triggers the spring thinner. <laughs> and up goes the noose and off goes the end. Jesus says the temptation to come into a situation like that is going to cross everybody's path multiple times. And that's to be understood and to be expected. But if you deliberately, consciously lead somebody to that kind of situation and you encourage them to step into the trap, that is serious stuff. He said it's better that you hide a millstone. He's talking about the great big ones that were pulled by animals. A millstone hung around your neck and thrown into the sea. Everyone gets the opportunity to sin in the course of their life, but what you choose to do with that is the key to a good life. So <clears throat> everybody has an inclination to sin. One of the things that I would like you to learn from this morning's message is if, if this is the needle for inclination to sin, where are you? Very, very much inclined to sin or not so inclined to sin? And I have a couple of examples to help you figure that out. So, we've gone shopping in the Greenwood Mall, and we are on our way home, and, and at the section of road where you are, there are only two vehicles, yours and a Brinks truck. And the truck driver's going a little fast, and he hits a pothole, not that there's any potholes in Indianapolis, but he hits a pothole, and the back door springs open, and out rolls a great big bag. And it's clearly marked casino in great big letters. And then as he swings around the corner, the door comes shut, and he doesn't even look in the mirror. He just keeps going down the road. And here is a bag in the middle of the road, right in front of you, and it says casino, and it's obviously got something inside of it. You have three choices to make. One, you pick up the bag, <coughs> put it in the car, drive as fast as you can to the next stop, and get the bag back to the Brinks driver. Of all the people surveyed on the internet, 2% would do that. 27%, I'm sorry, 27%. The second choice, you stop the car, you pick up, I, I've gone backwards. First stop, you pick it up and you take it home. And no one's the wiser. Number two, you pick it up and give it back. And 27% of the people surveyed would do that. And number three, you leave the bag lying on the ground and let somebody else pick it up. 98% of the people surveyed would pick the bag up. Now, the interesting question is, what would you do? 
Remember, the goal of the illustration is to determine where is the needle on your personal inclination to sin. And by the way, the lawyer in me wants you to know, full disclosure, in the state of Indiana, if you find money laying on the ground and you know who it belongs to, by law, you have to give it back. So if that bag is there with the word casino on it, and you have bad intentions, get home and destroy the bag really quickly. <laughs> I'm just joking. So you're one of the 63% that picked the bag up and took it home. So I, I, I'm just taking it home for safe keys, you know? I mean, I'm gonna put it in the garage, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to, I'll call Phil, Philip, and I'll have, I'll have Philip come and we'll figure out what to do. That's, that's what we're going to do, right? Except that the bag sits in the garage and it's really fat and it's really heavy. And you're thinking, what's in the bag? You know, there weren't any traffic cameras. There weren't any security cameras. Nobody's going to know what's in the bag. Well, it won't hurt to look, right? I mean, there's no harm in looking. So let's get the cutters and cut that block off of there. <gasps> And there's, it's stuffed with $100 bills. I mean, there's stacks of them. Like, maybe a hundred or $125,000 in that bag. Now what you gonna do? Where's your needle? Well, I'll just, I'll donate them all to the church. Well, thank you very much, appreciate it. <clears throat> I'm sure that'd be your first inclination. What would you do in that situation, I know what the Sunday school answer is. I'm not asking you for the Sunday school answer. I'm asking you to figure out what would you do. We're trying to find out what is your inclination to sin. We all have it. The question is, from zero to 100, where are you on the inclination to sin? Ladies, I have another example for you. Perhaps that doesn't trigger your, your trip your trigger. <clears throat> There's a word play back on the trip trigger. Okay. Um, so you uh, go to one of the gyms at the edge of uh, suburban or, uh, metro in Indianapolis, one of the big ones. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, your husband's busy all the time. So that's one of the things that you do to entertain yourself and go to the gym and hang out with the girls and work out. And you notice that there's a, a young, good-looking, handsome guy who seems to pay a lot of attention to you. He works there. He is a trainer and a, and a masseuse. And one day he says to you, well, you know, I, I have a private room upstairs that I'd be happy to show you and, uh, and give you a private massage. You know, and, and he seems very friendly and very warm and, and suddenly it starts to dawn on you what he's offering. And nobody's going to know. And, and how he hasn't been paying much attention lately. I mean, what's the harm? I mean, you know, does that move your needle, ladies? Now, if we were to flip that and say it was a female attendant and a man joining the number in the gym, we know where the needle is, amen? The question is, where are you inclined to sin? And if neither of those scenarios pushed your buttons, I bet if I tried hard enough, I'd find one. And here's the point of the story. The vast majority of people, if they are given an opportunity to cheat, lie, steal, or commit adultery and get away with it? You know what the vast majority of people will choose to do? They'll do it. But Jesus says, those that belong to me will not. In point of fact, in the, in the, in the letter to the Ephesians that Paul was writing, he teaches us something very, very important. Maybe one of the most critical things that we're to learn today. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Meaning, you were dead man walking. When, you, when your needle was over there, and you have no presence of Jesus Christ in your life, you are dead man walking. But, he says, God through His grace and mercy and love changed all of that. Paul makes this statement, which is what I want to come down on. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That is a first century way of referring to Satan. And Paul makes this point. We are influenced by one of two forces in the course of our life. Every day, every hour, every decision. We are influenced by one of two forces. And you cannot say, I'm not. 
Maybe you don't go to any Wicca meetings, and maybe you're not burning crosses on the lawn, but you are being influenced one way or the other. You're being influenced by Satan, or you're being influenced by God. Yes, we are free will decision makers. We are in control of our destiny. We can do what we want, but I promise you, you are being that needle is being leaned one way or the other. Somebody is influencing you. Somebody has the needle move. Is it Satan or is it God? If you don't hear anything else, if you don't remember anything else, remember this. You are being influenced in the decisions that you make, either by Satan or by God. Which is it? Where is the needle? That's the point of the two illustrations. To figure out where I am on this inclination to sin scale. We are influenced by Satan or influenced by God. How can we tell? Is there a way to tell? Yes. <clears throat> there are three words I'm going to put up on the screen. And the, and the purpose in putting up on those words is for you to figure out what do you believe about these three words. Where are you in regards to humanism, materialism, and recreational sex? If there was ever a Sunday, I wanted all my teenagers here, it was today. Can I have the next one? Humanism. Basic definition of humanism is that the, the peak of the created order is me, meaning you. The, 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 the epitome of creation. Humanism says that humankind is the epitome of creation. There isn't anything else. That's it. Just us. We're at the top of the order. Do you believe that? How strongly do you believe that? George Clooney, the actor, said, I don't believe in a heaven and hell. I don't know if I believe in a God or not. All I know is an individual only has so long, and I will not waste this life. That is the definition of humanism. And, and why is that so bad? Because if you are the top of the created order, where's God? Number two is materialism. The chasing of things. Of, or the things that they can buy or money. Right? Perfect example. <clears throat> there are lots of people in Rush County getting food stamps. There are lots of people living on subsidy checks or uh, disability checks. And when we see one of those in Kroger's, don't you point to them and say, man, that's what I want to be. Right? Isn't that what we say? No. No. You look at the dude rolling up in the BMW or the Mercedes, you go, that's, that's who I want to be. We don't idolize the poor. We idolize the rich. That's a sign of materialism. And finally, the third one is recreational sex. And what do I mean by recreational sex? Any sexual activity outside of the committed relationship that God has blessed, meaning the relationship God has blessed. <clears throat> sex was not given to us as a toy. Sex was not given for us to fool around with. Sex was given to us to bond two human beings together. You want to know a truth of social science? This is a truth. The first person you lose your virginity to is the one you will be closest to for the rest of your life. That person will occupy a place in your heart and your psyche that no one else can replace. Think about it. Not my fact. Look it up. That's why it was given to us that way, is to bond us in a deep, deep level. It's not a toy. It's not a game to mess around with. But depending on your attitude towards sex and why it was given to us, that tells me where the needle is. That's the point of the exercise. Where is the needle on the inclination to sin? <clears throat> all right. This morning, the message has been all over the yard, and yes, there's a pun there if you look for it. So here, what was I trying to teach this morning? What do I think the Holy Spirit was trying to teach us? Those three things that I just said are the three greatest lies that Satan has sold humankind. <clears throat> Number one, there's a difference between sin and trespass. Number two, we have a natural inclination to sin, to miss the mark. Three, sin separates us from our Creator, both here and in the hereafter. 3A, it's not up there. Either Satan is influencing you or the Holy Spirit is influencing you. Number four, God has a way out. He has a plan of salvation. 
But the plan of salvation has to be offered. If I could say to you in one sentence, in one sentence, what I would like most for all of you, more than anything in the world that I could do for you or give for you, I wish I could give you Jesus Christ. I wish I could open the door of eternity and show you what's really going on. I would like to reach back here in the corner and peel back the corner of time and let you see what's really going on because this world is not real, not the real deal. This is a place for us to build our relationship with God, to establish that relationship and to, and to prepare ourselves for what's coming. This life is a gift given to us by a creator for a reason, not to be squandered, chasing materialism, or chasing recreational sex. Or chasing the things that make us big and important. If by the decisions we make, by allowing our needle to be inclined towards Satan's desires, we have made a mess of our lives. We are living in a, a corn maze of our choosing. But this morning God wants to offer you a way out. I do not want to make anyone uncomfortable, but this is exactly what I was led to do this morning, so I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I don't ever do this, but this is what I was led to do this morning. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Would be gracious enough to allow everybody in the room to have privacy, so close your eyes, please. I'm not going to ask anybody to do anything, stand up, nothing. I'm just going to ask you this question. Do you... Where is your inclination to sin? Are you inclined to sin? Do you enjoy satisfying the needs of the body? Do you chase money? Are you the most important thing on the universe? Is your life messed up? Do you wish you could find a way out? Do you want to stop playing games? Do you want to find out what life is all about? Do you want the real deal, the real joy, the real confidence, the optimism, that comes with knowing who Jesus Christ is, with knowing what's going to happen at the end. would love to give you Jesus. If I could, I'd shove it down your throats. But you're, we have free will. It's a decision, a choice we make. And you don't have to know everything. You don't have to believe everything. You just have to take what you know and what you believe and give it back to Jesus in faith. Give him your life. There are seven basic facts about Jesus' life that we have to come to believe. Not agree with, but believe. He was God come to earth, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died voluntarily on the cross in place of us, was dead and buried, was raised up by God, and one day he'll come back again to ask the question, what did you do with the gift of life? What decision did you make about me? When those four historical facts become something that you believe in, it will convict you. And you will fall on your knees and ask for forgiveness of your sins. You will ask Jesus to take possession of your heart. And you will promise to live a different life that day forward. Using the Holy Spirit as the means. If you want that this day, I ask that you yourself, quietly to yourself, ask Jesus Christ to take possession of your heart. And apologize for your sins. Ask for forgiveness. Give Jesus control. And promise to live differently from this day forward. Holy Father, I thank you for the plan of salvation, for the clarity of the gospel that makes it very clear what's going on. I also thank you, Father, for the many pieces of evidence that you left behind that this rock is not an accident. Of all the billions and billions and billions of rocks in the known universe, this is the only one with life. When we consider all of the things required for life to be here, when we can look at the mathematical statistics, it is impossible for that to have happened by accident. May we take the evidence of the facts you left behind and come to the right conclusion that you are there, you wish to be in relationship with us, and the means to that is your son, Jesus. I, hope, I pray, Father, you will do what I cannot, which is to convict hearts, change lives, and change destiny. These things I ask in the most precious name I know. In the name of Jesus. And that's well. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Go in peace. Honor the Lord with the days that you have left.